Hi, my name is Carol, and today I'll be doing a deep dive into a study that we at the Developer Success Lab at Flow um, conducted on a concept called developer thriving. Okay. Okay, so I want to back up to about like 2021 or so, not that long ago. Okay, so this is when some really awesome research came out that essentially said, hey, big surprise, investing in developer satisfaction directly increases developer productivity. Okay. So as a clinical scientist, this is just one of those findings that I just find really interesting because we actually have decades of science showing this exact thing across a lot of other human experiences, right? And yet, despite that, every time we find it in a new context, in this case, developers, we really struggle to apply it. And a big, problem, a big part of that problem is that this term satisfaction is honestly just too vague. And so because of that, we often use it in ways that we just don't mean to. So for example, you've probably used the term satisfaction to mean things like feeling motivated, supported, fulfilled, etc. But technically, satisfaction really refers to a pretty broad range of experiences. So ranging from things like, mm, this is fine, right, to, yeah, I suppose I'm happy here. And so because this is what satisfaction actually means, how a lot of companies end up trying to increase it ends up being pretty flawed. So for example, they might kind of hope for the best and be like, oh, it'll just like kind of magically happen. Or they might throw swag at you and be like, here's a sticker, here's a water bottle, here's a boxy t-shirt in a deeply unflattering color. And you're like, okay. Or they might try to make work fun by trying to turn things into a game or a friendly competition, right? And the big problem with these is that these are all things that you might like well enough, right? But they won't actually motivate you. They won't make you feel like you belong and they won't fulfill you. And that's a really big problem because developers deserve better. They deserve to go beyond feeling fine, I guess, right? And into actually thriving as human beings. So what is developer thriving? So this is actually a term taken from clinical health and learning sciences, and it refers to the processes driving realistic and sustainable growth and development. I think what's really important to note here is that unlike satisfaction, um, which focuses on very immediate and temporary experiences, we call this taking a state-based approach, thriving actually focuses on taking a person and process-centered approach. And this is really good because this makes thriving not just a more stable measure of human experience, but it also makes a better fit for how humans experience the world, which, by the way, developers are, right? So if you're thinking, what do health, learning, psychology have to do with developers? I mean, I hate to break it to you, but like as humans, your health, education, and psychological well-being, they directly impact your ability to write code. Okay, so there are several processes that make up developer thriving, but when you look at the models across fields, so fields like clinical psychology, health, education, and development, you see that there are actually four primary factors that pretty consistently load onto thriving. And so in our study, we also define and measure developer thriving by adapting empirically validated measures based on these four factors. So that first factor is agency. So by this, we mean that developers have a voice in how they define things like work and success. So for example, if you're a developer with high agency, you might feel like you can collaborate with your manager to define what success looks like for you personally. The next one is belonging, key point. This doesn't just refer to feeling accepted for who you are, but it also means that you're non-judgmentally supported to grow and change. So for example, if you're a developer who feels like you really belong on your team, you not only feel like you can be yourself, but you feel supported to grow as a person. You're not expected to do the same thing and be the same exact person every day for the rest of your life, right? The third one is learning culture. This refers to a team culture that celebrates the entire learning process, including mistakes. So developers on a team with a good learning culture feel like they can talk about mistakes they've made and talk about what they've learned with teammates. Finally, the last one is self-efficacy and motivation. And this one refers to your perceived ability to work, succeed, and solve problems. So for example, if you're a developer with high self-efficacy and motivation, you don't just feel motivated about the code that you're writing, but you also feel pretty confident that you'll be able to manage any issues that come up with it. All right, so at this point, some of you are like, 
developer thriving, sold, awesome. And some of you are like, okay, who cares? Like, why do we care about this? Okay, so first of all, our study found that developer thriving significantly predicted productivity. In other words, when you increase your developers thriving, you also increase that producti pr productivity, sorry. And this means that you can ship products faster, you improve the quality of your code, and you're building sustainable systems for long-term success, right? Other research also shows that when your developers are thriving, they're more likely to stick around. That means increased retention, decreased turnover. And then finally, it helps you become a better leader. It doesn't just help your team see how much you appreciate them, but it also helps other people see, hey, how awesome is this team, right? Okay, so in a nutshell, thriving is awesome. We want it sold. But where do we get it? It's not on Amazon Prime. It's not like at the thriving store and you just like buy it for everyone. It's not on the farm where you like pick some off a tree, right? It's not apple picking. So how do we get it? Okay, so we got you there too. So to answer this, we conducted a series of qualitative interviews and focus groups. From these, we heard two major themes. The first is this theme around visibility and value. That is when developers feel like their work is seen, recognized and valued, they experience greater thriving. So for example, you see this here in a quote from an IC who talks about how being given credit during feature demos not only gives them a sense of ownership, but also empowerment. We also see this theme around healthy metrics use, which we define as tracking performance in a team-driven way using metrics that work for that team's context. So for example, in this quote here, NIC talks about how in the context of minoritized identities, such as gender, metrics can actually be an equalizer in getting your work seen. So we tested if healthy metrics use and visibility of value could both directly and indirectly increase developer thriving and productivity. And we did this using something called a serial mediation analysis. Okay, so there's a lot of effects here. Um, so I'm just going to break down the main ones, and then you can read about the rest of them in our research report. All right, so we're going to pay attention to the orange here, okay? So first we see that when you, as a leader, decide, hey, I'm going to invest in healthy team-driven metrics, right? You're actually able to directly increase the visibility and value of developers' work. And this makes sense because you're now just more able to clearly evaluate, see, and celebrate that work. Because that increased visibility and value helps you recognize and reward work, and it helps you identify unmet needs and friction, you're also now able to both directly and indirectly increase your developers' thriving. And then bringing it all together, because that increased thriving means that your developers are now more motivated, better able to solve problems, collaborative, collaboratively learn and grow, and communicate with leaders, you're also now able to directly and indirectly increased developer productivity. So how can you put this into practice on your teams? So you can use this really awesome acronym I made and dare to do more, okay? That is, you can diagnose, agree, recognize, and explore. And yes, Mike pointed out to me that dare was this really strange anti-drug campaign from the 80s and 90s. So think about this as like us reclaiming dare as like the cool version, okay? It's the effective version. All right, so back to dare. So first, you can diagnose if there are gaps in developer thriving. And you can do this by using the four factors of our framework. This is a really good way to figure out what leadership and growth opportunities you need to focus on first, for example. So it might turn out, for example, that you have teams with a really high learning culture, which is awesome, um, but they might also have low agency to speak out with leaders. And that might show, hey, we've got some knowledge silos to break down, right? Second, you can reach agreement with your team on how to define and measure performance. So fun aside, our study also found that most folks didn't know what metrics their leaders were using or if their leaders were even, use metric, were even using metrics, right? Which is just really hard then to know if your work is even seen, much less valued. So an important thing to do is seek agreement on and establish healthy, agreed upon, team-driven metrics. You can use this to gauge performance and give kudos. Um, speaking of kudos, you know, be sure to reward and recognize um, effort. Folks spoke a lot about worrying if their work and effort is recognized and valued, not only by folks in their team, but also outside of their teams and by the org, right? So whether it's by championing their work to leadership or celebrating effort in addition to outcomes, you know, finding a way to do this is really important. 
And then finally, explore our entire research report. Um, it touches on many, 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 many more research findings, insights, and recommendations, all of which you can find on our website at devsuccesslab.com. And that is it. Phenomenal. Yay. Oh, gosh, bittersweet. The last one. But what a way to close, right? We are important. We matter. Our mentality matters. Our health matters, mental and physical. We got to think about these things. I do want to note, this was obviously specific to developers, but in academia, we need to be thinking about these things, too. We want to be thriving as, you know, computer scientists in academia as well. So thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, so we have a couple of questions in the uh, Slack. If anyone else has questions, please feel free to put them uh, as I get started here. One, uh, Emma actually said, and the obvious question, so I don't know if she meant to get an answer, but we're going to put it out there anyways and see what your thoughts are. How does worker democracy help developers thrive? Mm. I think that, so worker democracy kind of referring back to this agency piece, right? Mm. Uh, when you have agency, when you have a choice to uh, kind of have a say in how your work is measured or how your work is done, right? Nobody knows you better than you. Mm. Nobody knows how you work better than you, right? It's not me, you know, even if I'm a researcher, it's not Brittany, it's not Greg, right? you know it best. And so you being able to speak up just best supports your ability to get work done in a healthy and sustainable way, right? So. Absolutely. So not just having the ability to say that, but feeling like someone's actually listening when mm -hmm. you say it, which I think, you know, speaks to the kind of full, the full circle there. Um, okay. And the next question, I, you know, we're going to, we're going to put it out there anyways, because I don't know if it was meant to be real or not, but I do know that puppies are a thing as far as mental health. Are there any controlled studies on the impact of puppies on developer satisfaction? And this follow up, this is really important. Make sure you listen carefully here. If so, how do they compare with baby otters, which our question asker oh. here, Greg, personally believes are the gold standard? What are your I mean, thoughts on this? Baby otters are so cute. I can't even, I can't even handle it. I'm like having trouble focusing now. <laughs> okay. So when I taught research methods, cause I am a former academic, uh, we used to actually talk about this study that did look at the impact of puppies on just like mental health and stress, et cetera. Um, you know, in a controlled setting, awesome. Long-term success, like, you know, like, what are you going to do? Like bring the puppy <laughs> around with you and like hope it never poops and pees on you and like, Choose up all your furniture, probably not, right? So great short-term success fix, not so great in the long term. Fair enough, fair enough. Although I would love to have a puppy that's just big enough that I could actually oh. successfully do that. Beautiful. Or a baby <laughs> otter. Not, not as sustainable, but fantastic. Um, I think one thing I'm kind of curious about is what it looks like to to evaluate the effectiveness of the methods that you that would be employed to follow this dare model right if if the goal is thriving which is defined but really kind of subjective right what what are some thoughts you have on how we how we uh, evaluate and improve on the methods that we're we're kind of trying i guess to to fit this model 100% yeah so i think survey okay survey design is so complicated right it feels easy because you're like, of course, I can ask questions. But then the answer is like, well, are you asking good questions? And are those questions reliable? Are they valid? Have you done like an empirically validated study looking at them? Right. right. And so right. we actually did that did start to validate our questions. Um, mm -hmm. And all of our questions come from empirically valid, validated measures. Right. So, you know, people often think about. Gosh, thriving is so subjective. Does that mean we can't measure it? Right. Right. And like right. the answer is no. Right. When you go to the doctor, your doctor isn't like, gosh, like your heart rate is fine. And you're like, but I just don't feel good. And they're like, mm, no one cares how you feel. Right. Like <laughs> what you're saying is still information. That's still really important. So, right. you know, it's a matter of kind of taking all data sources together and using them as one. Right. Not just kind right. of pinpointing or cherry picking each one. So. 